Happy Sabbath, everyone. Welcome back to Study 7. My name is Chelsea, and I'm joined by my co-host, Stefan. And our, not really guest, but our Study 7 <laughs> team is here to facilitate the discussion tonight. We have Jaron and we have Luin. So thank you guys for coming through. You're all no problem. Tonight, we're going to be looking at lesson number eight, which is a continuation from last week. So it is Teaching Disciples Part 2. So if you're joining now, you didn't watch last week's, you might want to hop back over and check that out just so you have the full picture. But before we get started, Luin, can you give us a word of prayer, please? Dear Jesus, as always, we come to you tonight to discuss your lesson. And I pray that you allow us to say things that make sense and are easily explained so that persons viewing would understand. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So our memory text was taken from Mark chapter 10, verse 45, and it reads, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Good. And Sunday section entitled, God's Plan for Marriage. Hmm. Here we have an account of Jesus speaking to the Pharisees in Mark chapter 10. The Pharisees asked Jesus an interesting question. Their question was, is it lawful for a man to put away, which is divorce his wife, tempting him? Jesus responded in a way, I figure, Jesus responded in a way, I figure was exactly how the Pharisees wanted him to respond by asking them what Moses had commanded them. They then gave their answer, which was Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and to dismiss her. That is from the New King James Version. Jesus, however, with his witty response said, because of the hardness of your hearts, he wrote this preset. He proceeds in verses 6 through 12, saying that from, a, that from creation, God made male and female. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. The two shall become one flesh. Whosoever shall put away, divorce again his wife, and marry another, committeth adultery against her. And if a woman shall put away her husband and be married to another, she committeth adultery. So the question is asked, what lessons did Jesus teach in his response? And what can you or your congregation or your church do to strengthen the marriages among us? Mm. Well, I just wanted to <coughs> start with some statistics. <laughs> So I was looking globally, but then I was like, okay, let me just bring it closer to home. So I had found on the Adventist Family Ministry site, they were saying they had a survey. I don't remember the exact dates, but it was saying that subjects reported having experienced divorce from their spouse. And that ranged from like 10 to 28%, because of course this is across the worldwide conference. So across different divisions, it was about 10 to 28%. And you know, a lot of the statistics, even globally, are showing the increasing rate of divorce. And I guess that's for many different factors. Maybe now it's easier to get a divorce. We see celebrities married for what? A day and then <laughs> that's yeah. it. But what I thought was interesting was Jesus's response to them. Mm -hmm. Yes, he took them back um, to Moses's command, but he also pointed back to God's ideal mm -hmm. for what okay. marriage was. And we see that in Genesis 2, 18, 21 to 24. It's not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Mm -hmm. And we know the whole story, man fell asleep, which was Adam. God um, took from his rib, closed him up, et cetera, et cetera. Then man said, this is no bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman for she was taken out of a man. <laughs> this is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh what was interesting for me is jesus pointing about how god's ideal is in genesis mm -hmm. which means marriage in itself was created before sin mm -hmm. it wasn't a result of sin like some yeah. other things that we have you know as women we have um <coughs> menstrual cycle etc which came but marriage was there from the beginning is something sanctified wholly by God. Yeah. Um, so what I think now is interesting is we've seen, though, the result of sin has been divorce. Mm -hmm. So the case law that he was citing in Deuteronomy was actually an exception that was created, if we could put it that way, to protect the vulnerable. And it was interesting how now the Pharisees and the people at that time were twisting it to allow for divorce not to be easier and say, well, you know, this is a contradiction. But if you look at even, and it's not just marriage, it's other cases where Jesus was protecting the vulnerable. In this case, it was considered to be the woman in the case. So there's rules and regulations for if you divorce a woman, what should happen, how you should go about this, et cetera. And the lesson actually alluded to that. It said the case law described in Deuteronomy 24 was meant to provide protections for the woman. Um, but in Jesus's day, it was twisted by the school of Hillel to make it easier to get a divorce for almost any 
reason. So the law which was meant to protect women was now being thrown aside to just allow for divorce. So for me, it was interesting to see that. And I know taking it, I guess, away from marriage, we do that with a lot of Bible verses as well to kind of suit our own thing. Um, and to the latter part of the question, before I hand over to the others, what can the church or, or we do? Um, so just a plug for Breath of Life family life committee. <laughs> we do have these sessions um, for married couples or those who are courting. Um, or even those who are divorced or going through trouble marriages. And it's a really good place. It's like a safe community. You come together and we're able to share because I know something we speak about is like, oh, what is marriage life like? Sometimes you get married, you don't know what was required because people paint this rosy picture. Mm -hmm. But for me, it was really good to be a part of this program. And it happens regularly. Um, and there is a facilitator, like a trained um, counselor as well that facilitates these sessions. And there's an open space where you can learn from young married couples, old married couples, people who've been through it, et cetera, people who suffered loss, et cetera. So for me, I think that's something that is working and helping a lot of marriages and being able to have like partners that you can speak to when you're going through of course in confidence your own situations and who will point you back to god because you can have one partner who's saying my yeah just left she just divorced she it easy you know you, you must sign your prenup or you don't got much no just leave her no but when you have that partner who understands god's ideal you know is more pointing you to stay connected and remain married mm -hmm. All right, so following that episode of the Chelsea wow. show, I, I, I think I she can, left no, I no stone unturned. So I want to add. What I will say very simply and shortly is that the lesson that the Lord was trying to demonstrate in his response was that marriage is something that should be eternal, mm. right? Yeah. Uh, there's this text that, or this phrase that is mentioned at weddings, every father do it all the time when he does them. And it says, um, what therefore God has joined together, let no man put asunder, mm. right? Ultimately, God would have been the person who would have joined the two, the male and the female in this marriage before God, right? Yeah. He's just simply trying to demonstrate to the Pharisees here who were once again, trying to build a fast one on him mm -hmm. um, that mar divorce is something that should not take place, right? Which then now lends to the importance of marriage. It's not just something that you get into because I love you and we can just Figure it out is a serious thing. Mm -hmm. So much yeah. so like Lord is saying that once you do this, it shouldn't end. Right? So it kind of showcases me one. Jesus is saying, when he joins people, they should not separate. Mm -hmm. yeah. Secondly, when you get into this thing, it's a serious thing. So take it as such. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, what can we do to strengthen marriages in our congregation? And it's not least sure, but in conversation before we um, started podcast, uh, we were talking about probably taking the dating process a little more seriously, mm -hmm. yeah. right? You know, I mean, a man seeing a woman that he likes, he likes her, she looks nice. You know, we have a good time, um, whatever else, but it is more than that. There are some challenges that will come up as a result of two people from different backgrounds living together and sharing a life mm -hmm. together. And as a result, you will need to be able to deal with the situations as they come up. It's not as simple as saying, well, I sick of you, I get my mother, and I done with you on this. Yeah. Mm. Or it shouldn't be, because it, sometimes it's not simple. That's true. Um, but you will need to find ways to deal with the issues that arise. And you know that marriage is often painted as this really great thing, you know, like we love one another, we can go to this place and we can build this and we have children. And no one often speaks about the issues that arise, mm -hmm. right? Like how this person that you sleep with are next to every day, uh, sickens you, right? <laughs> and you need to find ways in which to deal with that. Because as I just mentioned earlier, when you make the step to be married, it is something that is supposed to be eternal, right? Or till death do us part, mm -hmm. right? With that said, you need to take great care in the relationship that you would have, there is again on too long, I can finish mm -hmm. now. <laughs> in, the, in the relationship that you would have decided to get into and that would have led to marriage. And as a result, I think that taking the dating process a little more seriously would aid in, str in stronger marriages. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think um, Chelsea calling and, Kettle Black. <laughs> I think, I think Chelsea and Living get a much fulsome answer. But I would just say that I think also too as a, a church, you should encourage, as you said, encourage the dating process. Mm -hmm. Encourage people to take their time because I, the tendency in church is that once you see two young people together, marriage, when y'all get married, mm -hmm. and you start mm -hmm. to put pressure on people to sort of rush yeah. a decision. The other times where 
you know, um, situation in church where persons get, you know, pregnant out of wedlock. And so the church encourages to get married, I guess. I don't know if it's seemingly trying to fix the situation. I think it's trying to save face. But to me, you know, you, sometimes you push people in a situation that may, may not have been ready for. Yes, mm. they did the act. I think is getting married doesn't correct it mm-hmm. in, any, in any essence. So I think it's just an encouraged person to take the dating process seriously, as you said. And give people time to mm-hmm. to work through the relationship so that, you know, when they get married, then they have that good communication. They know each other well. And, you know, God will keep them together. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, based on what you was saying, um, I was thinking along those lines too. Um, <clears throat> I think that we encourage putting the, what the person yeah. saying, the cart right before, before the horse. horse. Yeah. Right? We don't encourage the dating process. We encourage the marriage, mm. but we we ought to encourage the dating process first. So um, before um, we were before we started the podcast, I was actually telling Ruel or Alanis was telling Ruel like how long we dated before we even decided to yeah. become a couple, and then how long we were together before we even decided to be married. So I think like mm. those those types of things uh, play a, a vital part in in how you as a person handle your marriage, how you um, behave during your marriage, how you handle conflict resolution during the marriage. Which is very important. Yeah, es- especially important. But yeah. um, I think that a lot of marriages can be salvaged by sharing all necessary information as well. As Leslie said, I think persons tend to, to paint this whole nice picture of marriage. And yes, marriage is a nice thing, but we, we ought to also understand that as a result, as Leslie said, of two persons coming together with different background, mm-hmm. yeah. differences, different stuff. you will always have um, differences, yeah, exactly. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, I, I, I think that we should, we should help persons by sharing the, the necessary info, like just the good, the, good, the bad, and the, the good, ugly. the all, bad, all and it. the ugly. I yeah. think that yeah. that should be standard and necessary in all marriages and and yeah. just to strengthen what chelsea said um i had here also to reference the the referee mm-hmm. sessions mm-hmm. that chelsea and jerron actually invited on us and too and we actually went and it was good so for all the married couples out there all the courting couples <laughs> see chelsea and <laughs> see jerron all right so continuing in mark chapter 10 because that's the focus of this week's study we saw the aspect we just discussed about marriage. Then we see Jesus and children on the Monday section. Um, we have here in Mark 10, 13 to 16, it reads, And they brought young children to him, that he should touch them. And his disciples rebuked those that brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was not pleased and said unto them, Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. And he took them up in his arms, put his hands upon them and blessed them. Seeing here, it is a familiar text that we all hear, especially growing up in church. But seeing here how Jesus reacts to and for children, what does this tell us about the importance of children within our church? All right. So before we get to the answer for that question, I'm right? jumping in quick, quick, quick. Now. <laughs> because I go the same thing before I want to say, right? Um, on Monday, it, 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 it said something that I didn't fully know before. Mm-hmm. So it said, well children, well, children were desired. They were of a low social status mm. along the lines of slaves, mm. actually. Right. And then the Galatians 4, 1 and 2 kind of gives that, gives more information there. Now, was it that the disciples were not excited for the children to come and interact with Jesus, seeing that they would have been of a low <laughs> social status? No, mm. I am uncertain because they didn't say that in particular, mm-hmm. but the, the lesson made mention of that. I like children were sold as slaves, boys were preferable, mm-hmm. um, etc. So like seeing that some children don't wanted to come to Jesus, these lowly beings wanted to come to interact with <coughs> this great person. Um, was it then, uh, was that then the reason why the disciples were like, yeah, just relax on yourself, don't come here. I, I I don't take it that way. I would mm. say I more think they were trying to answer for Jesus in mm. saying master, the master doesn't have time for this. Yeah, not necessarily not. Like they were looking down on the children, but they look highly of Jesus, just as they should. Mm. But they thought that these things were below Jesus. And or Jesus with children. interacting with children. 
He came to heal people. He came to seek, you know, and save the lost sheep of Israel, the little yes. children. Salvation is big people business. So yeah. it was like, but when you look at the Bible and even now, who are the vulnerable groups? Mm. Typically women, children, Old elderly. Yeah. And even when you look in the different laws, taking your point, um, Lewin, Jesus does set um, regulations to protect the elderly, women, single women, widows, and children. So, I mean, it could be a mix of, well, one, your importance sadly is often tied to your social status in society so it could be a mixture of both what you and john said in the sense of john is you know salvation is big people business but at the same time we don't see you all as important because you know you just that you haven't arrived yet yeah. so i guess that's how i see it i believe i believe it's a mixture of both as well mm -hmm. yeah, but, i mean looking to the question what does this tell us about the importance of children in church for me just thinking generally importance of children especially for a country a community and especially for a church they are the future because they are the ones who are going to carry on the work i know you were saying um as a country so you know here in barbados they're from christ <laughs> for us to have more children no so. <laughs> we all need to do our part <laughs> 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 but i just saying like they are the ones who are meant to carry on the work so my thing is if you exclude them then the question mm -hmm. is what happens to the church correct you know Church yeah, and, says this. and persons often say this like if you see a church without youth or young people the church is going to die mm -hmm. precisely because when you put 50 years on the age of everybody in there <sighs> and everybody is 124 like you don't expect that the, the, they're going to be alive for that long exactly and if you don't have any other persons like coming up like who's going to maintain the functions of your church evangelize help those in the community if you don't set up like anything for mm -hmm. succession mm -hmm. right so um I think generally too, uh, even though Jesus didn't necessarily say this, um, having children in any organization is important. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. And let me sprinkle a little EGW on top of it. As somebody, uh, uh, a quote that people always mentioning to me, somebody from church particularly, we're such an army of workers as our youth, rightly trained, might furnish how soon the message of a crucified, risen, and soon coming savior might be carried to the whole world. So mm -hmm. they are involved in the, the work of evangelizing and caring for the mission. So, mm. yeah. I think uh, for me, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. For me, I had an interesting thing about, yes, the future. I had, um, but I was saying what Whitney Houston's lyrics this in his song, Greatest Love of All. You guys bring a song lyric every week. You know. <laughs> so she said, I believe the children are our future, which you guys were just saying. Mm -hmm. Then they point, teach them well and let them lead the way. We have to include them. Show them all the beauty they possess inside. Give them a sense of pride to make it easier. Let the children's laughter remind us how we used to be. Now that line for me showed me another importance that I think children have in our church they should be an example for us as well. I know in many cases, we're the example for them. But when you think about that line and you remember when you was young and you were it's carefree so and happy, <laughs> the rest of us were carefree and happy. Um, and it takes me back to the whole point of where Jesus said there um, in verse 15, the same Mark 10, um, verse 15, Verily I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter it. So... Yeah. Why is God telling us we have to be like children? When you look at the characteristics children have, trust and dependence. Children look completely to their parents. If you look at Ruel's son, interacting with Ruel, he's looking at Ruel for everything. Like Ruel's the best person in the world. He knows nothing else. Yeah. That is what God expects us to look at him like. Humility. Children just, they're like, well, I hear, I know how I get here. You want to be my friend? Oh, I got snacks. You want some? You know, um, the faith that they have as well. You tell a child, you know, and that's what's important. We teach children as well. You know, God loves you. He will provide for you. And children can pay, pray earnestly for this thing, trusting in God. So for me, and they're very receptive as well. If we look at children as our example of how we should be, especially when it comes to having that relationship and trusting and total dependence on God, I think they're a true example as well for us. Yeah. Also, um, Jesus was trying to showcase, like, as you would have mentioned, the simplicity that children have, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you, you could look at children at church, from church, like, you know, like, children will see Ukraine. What well, Ukraine, like, mm -hmm. and what happened to you? You, you pray to Jesus? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you understand? Jesus is everything to them. Yeah. And the simplicity that they have in, like, completely trusting Jesus. You know, like, 
he just got some videos on Instagram now where you know, somebody will be signed up by him, someone trying to get, and the person will be falling back. And the person doesn't catch them. <laughs> the person will walk and turn the camera and be like, uh, trust him, God, not yeah, man, man. <laughs> right? Um, children showcase that trust in Jesus so much that it's kind of crazy. Mommy, you ain't got no, you ain't got no food. We, we pray. Yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. And they believe that by just praying to Jesus now, the cupboard can become full. And mm-hmm. Jesus ultimately wants us to like showcase that the simplicity and mm-hmm. the, as the lesson said, implicit trust in him and mm-hmm. that children have. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody stole all my notes, but I can still <laughs> go through them a little bit. Um, Matthew 18, three to four says, that set you be converted and become as little children. You yeah. shall not mm-hmm. enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself, as he mm-hmm. said, as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So. Uh, from this, my interpretation is that we ought to learn from children as well and not only try to teach children, as Chelsea mm. said, right? We ought to learn from children daily. And then this text told me about the mindset of a child, as Chelsea um, alluded to as well. Children forgive in the blink of an eye. Children, for the most part, are sharers, givers. Children are empathetic, sympathetic, yeah. right? <clears throat> All attributes that we ought to have mm-hmm. if we are to, to be Christ-like. And, and ultimately receive the goal, which is eternal life, right? So I think that when Jesus, um, when when reading this text, it was speaking about the mindset mm-hmm. and the characteristics of a child. And and I have a interesting thing here. Um, I think that this is where some of our leaders know, and 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 the lesson spoke about that as well. But we can go on to that further. This is where some of our leaders actually fall down in this mm. aspect because they think that they're, they're, they're leaders that think that when they are in position to lead that they must only lead mm. but a great leader is also a great servant as we are going mm. to yeah, we get find out yeah. later in the lesson right and and i think <coughs> that children are that example of how we should serve right and i think that they are also persons who tend not to take the the information or the advice or or the ideas from children but tend to lean on their own understanding and that's when Mm. things begin to to yeah which which is i guess the point i was thinking about too in that children always they they learn from the parents and they're willing to learn and i think that's sort of attribute that we also need to to have where we are willing to learn from god mm-hmm. as you said leaning not on our own understanding but acknowledging him in all our ways so I, think, I think that's an important part as Correct. well and this also tells me that that not only that children are important but the rearing of children is, yeah, is very important the teachings mm. the behaviors we we exhibit around them the things we see around children how we interact like so we we in turn have a vital role to play in the lives of children so with all that's going on in our society today, and I know Stefan would have started to allude to some ways, okay. how can we help bring children to Jesus? And even when Stefan was talking, I was thinking about this, um, this section at the bottom of Monday's Shh, section. I got all my notes here. Like, <laughs> oh, let not your unchristlike character misrepresent Jesus. Jesus. And as you, mm. things you say, as my thing is you want to bring children to church correct but then you get in the church you get in the car after church you talk about all the bad things that happen at church you talk about the church people and thing you sort of you work. misrepresent christ correct you made church out to be a thing a place that doesn't it doesn't seem that like you want to be there correct so why should they want to be there so I, I think my thing is we need to give make church the the best place in the world and i would say also make sabbath the best thing to remain that sabbath the highlight of the week so that children yeah. want to be correct in God's presence at this time. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I pull in from that same that same <laughs> quotation, right? Because they say like, "Do not keep little ones away from Him, but your coldness and harshness, as John mentioned, mm-hmm. never give them cause to feel that heaven would not be pleasant mm-hmm. if you were there." <laughs> you <know that? laughs> Correct. Do not speak of religion as something that children cannot understand, right? As uh-huh. or uh, as if they were not expected to accept Christ in accept their childhood. Christ in their in their childhood. childhood. Yeah. So basically it's saying to me that the way how we present Christianity and like giving mean, we're Adventist or Adventism mm-hmm. should be of such that a child would understand and want to be a part of it. Correct. Especially right? last part, it says, do not give them the false impression that the religion of Christ is a religion of gloom mm-hmm. and that coming to the Savior, they must give up all that makes life joyful. Yeah, Correct. so that, by saying that, that says to me that <laughs> this Christian, 
our Christianity should be something that is exciting and fun. Enjoyable. That isn't boring. Yeah. If only your church services would reflect that. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. But it, it, if you could get it set up in such a way that children have a good experience uh, learning about Jesus, mm-hmm. imagine what happens then not to the adults. Yeah. Correct. Mm-hmm. Right? But so the, so the, the same but, emphasis that we place on the main party service you need to give to children's ministries. Correct. Yeah. So I was yeah. going to say, we do have facets that are really good in itself. Yeah. Bible school. I know that has been a big thing for a lot of people who I know. Their only touch point to church has been through Bible school. That's a big thing for community outreach. We used to do branch Sabbath school where we actually had for the children in the community, a Sabbath school, at a lady in the community's house, and they would come, their parents would send them. Adventures and Pathfinders, I think, are one of the biggest things. Up to this day, I have friends. They are not in the church, but their best memories, and they would tell you, yeah. is Adventures, path, well, Pathfinders, especially because we get older, you got the camps. Some people travel just because of Adv- um, Pathfinders. Mm-hmm. First time they get on a plane and so and they remember that, and they don't forget, you know, they remember the verses, memories, but it was in a fun way. You learn about the Bible, you learn life skills, and they felt part of a community. So I think those are important avenues that we have that we need to continue to amplify. Yeah. And you know, yeah, Leslie and Jerron could invite your children to um, buy and camp. And, mm. and <laughs> and buy and um, uh, what I have here very quickly is that we need more programs geared towards reaching young people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And one thing Leslie spoke to me about um, is restarting sports evangelism, mm. right? Because young people like sports. And uh, um, so the sport, we, we used to have a Saturday night football tournament and stuff yes, like that. I so, um, we used to play cricket on Sundays. Cricket on Sundays. Yeah. No, we're trying to uh, implement uh, a road tennis tournament too. So, no, I would tell you on the podcast, please. Uh, yeah, we can, we can look out for those coming uh, mm-hmm. in the short term. But I think that, that sports evangelism is one way that we can actually reach, yeah. reach young people and reach children, especially the community as well. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. Um, Tuesday section, the best investment. We continue in Mark 10, 17 to 31, where Jesus has an encounter with a man. The Bible tells us that this man came to Jesus asking, what shall I do? What shall I do to gain eternal life? Hmm. Jesus's response again is one that is very well thought through. Jesus responds by telling him he knows the commandments, don't kill, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't bear false witness, honor thy father and mother, etc. The man responds by telling Jesus that he has done all of these things from his younger days up until now. Then Jesus does what he does best. He very calmly tells this man what he lacks. He proceeds by saying, sell whatever you have and give to the poor Mm. and thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come take up the cross and follow me. We see that in the way that this man's response that he is clearly not ready for his, for this eternal life that he's asking for. As he goes away, very sad because as the Bible labels it, he had great possessions. Mm. So what crucial lessons about faith and the cost of discipleship for anyone, rich or poor, is revealed here? Before you jump in, Louis, <laughs> no, I, I didn't want to ask you a question yet, but before you jump in, yeah. you know what I found interesting too? As it, I asked, did, actually, the first one I noticed is when you read it just now. Mm-hmm. When Jesus started listing the commandments, yep. he didn't start from the first four, you know? Nope. He started from the last of six. Yep. So he already knew what the man was lacking. <laughs> so he skipped that part. And the man said, yes, they're doing all these things. Correct. Then he hit you with the thing that, you, that you're lacking. It Correct. Yeah, it was that just, it was not that interesting. Correct. I feel like Jesus was a fast on the man. <laughs> like the man seems to be interested, seemed yeah. to be interested in doing what was necessary. And instead of working with him, Jesus showcased all the things that he wasn't doing. Mm-hmm. That's what it seemed to me. But it was crazy when you know, it then went, went on to say that it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle <laughs> than for a rich man to make it into the kingdom of heaven. Yeah. Right? And ultimately, he was saying too that if you have all of these things and you're unwilling to like get rid of them in order to follow Jesus, you would have effectively put these things above oh, God. God. So these things are idle. And ultimately, that's why the man or why rich people may be unable to make it into the kingdom of heaven. Mm-hmm. And it's unfortunate that it's crazy that the man was willing to do all of these other things except this. Mm-hmm. Right? Because these other things are easy to do. It was easy for him. Yeah. Right. And it, it showcases that God really wants like some serious commitment when you decide to be a disciple of his. Yeah. Right. 
the money that you got and the nice car that you got and the big job that you got, if you really want to follow me, let that go. Correct. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? Now, I mean, in today's age, it may not necessarily mean to sell your car and to quit your job, but it should be set up in such a way that you put God first. Mm-hmm. And I, based on what is being said, I ain't rich, so I can't really relate, right? Yeah. But it's, <laughs> <laughs> what is being said is that when you have these things, it is very difficult to set those aside for God. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And ultimately that is what he wants from us. Mm-hmm. I was, I, go ahead, sorry. No, I was telling uh, one of my friends today, um, some, sometimes we ask God for money, like, like as if we're dog broke, right? Mm-hmm. And and we don't see it come true. And I was telling him like, sometimes we, we don't even be mindful that we sometimes are mismanaging the money, the, mm. the little bit that we got. And then we want to ask God for a lot for more. You think you think that God can bless you with money, a lot of money, when you can't handle the little bit of money. True. So I think that that this is what Jesus was actually telling this man. Not that he's mismanaging, but he was not ready to do this to earn this, right? And I think that I would have said it here in previous episodes. Um, the cost of discipleship. Sometimes we are called to give up loads of stuff even might be the ultimate sacrifice, which is our lives, right? Yeah. Sometimes that is a call for our discipleship. And um, if our faith is growing in Jesus, then we would not be hesitant to give up like this man because he had great possessions. Like he said, he 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 think that the man was doing all of this, but not this. But I think based on, on my interpretation is that he was doing this because he, he just out of... You know, like this is the right thing to do. Of mm-hmm. obligation right? for the law. Yeah. Exactly. Not not because he loved Jesus. Because mm-hmm. if he loved Jesus, he would have found it very easy to give up his possessions. So I think that he was just following these things out of obligation. And and to answer the the first part of the question, what crucial lessons about faith? Um, Gerard would have heard me say um countless times that I I just love hymns, right? Mm-hmm. And there's a hymn. Um, him number 533. Don't sing it, Stefan. Oh, for a few. I'm not singing it. I'm not singing it. But, but uh, if you pay attention to the lyrics, right? Mm. Um, the hymn tells us that we need to have a faith that will not shrink. Mm. Although persons may challenge it. by many of all. Correct. It may be challenged by poverty, challenged by beatings, because it spoke about the chastening rod. And every tree says it shall shine so bright and clear that when danger, when in danger, it just does not know not any, any fear. fear. Right? I think that, that, that is the importance of our faith. And then we know the the the, the very popular Bible verse that with faith as small as a mustard seed, that we could be able to move mountains. So I think that that faith and the cause of discipleship um is intertwined. And I think that when when our faith is to a point where it, it as it said is unmoved in in the hymn and where it, it just would not shrink, then our um call for discipleship becomes very easy as well yeah i when i was thinking about the cost of discipleship um chelsea the rain song lyrics so i bring in a movie reference um if y'all watch avengers when gamora and stanos no, about his we don't have anything, man. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know where anyways yeah, yeah, yeah. so for those avengers, who actually watch this avengers. thing when when gamora and stanos about his mission she asked him well what did it cost and he said everything, everything. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. wait what Everything. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, then. Yeah, yeah. I was so, reading your lips. So I was like, <laughs> <laughs> so my thing is for him, his mission was so important that he gave up everything mm-hmm. for it. Mm-hmm. And when Jesus asks us to take up our cross and follow him, he's telling us that it's likely going to cost us everything. Everything. And in that scripture you mentioned in Mark ten seventeen to thirty one, in verse twenty nine it says, "Jesus said, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house." or brothers, or sister, or mother, or father, or children, or farms for my sake, and for the gospel's sake, but that he will receive a hundred times as much now in the present age, Mm -hmm. houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, and children, and farms, along with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. So Jesus is saying that we need to forsake all of it to follow him, point blank. The cost of discipleship is everything. But more important than the cost, though, is what we have to gain. And he mentions here eternal life. Mm -hmm. I know Chelsea can be upset because this can be a whole episode, but I got another point. <laughs> so like it says here that like, Tuesday. Yeah. Mark Mark <laughs> notes that Jesus has loved the man, right? Yeah. Uh, it says um there's something appealing about the man's idealism. But Jesus tested sincerity by asking him to sell everything and follow him. Yeah. Right. Um 
I think today too, there are probably people who are here saying, yeah, Jesus, I will follow you. Probably people who are following him mm -hmm. as well, uh, but are unwilling to sacrifice the things that they really need to, to, to be for it, to be sincere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The guy was willing to follow Jesus. He was unwilling to do what was necessary to actually do so wholeheartedly. And I think today's, uh, we more than likely have people. Yeah. yeah. And I think there's something to look out for because ultimately, Jesus doesn't want that. And we need to adjust this. Yeah. Go ahead, Chelsea. Yeah. No, I was just going to wrap that up by saying, as you said, we struggle with it. It doesn't just have to be riches. It could be anything for myself. I found there were some things I wanted to give up to have a close relationship with Christ. And I found it hard. Like, I was like, wow, I like, I like this thing more because I'm yeah. so used to doing it. What's well, not? Um, well, I was watching certain, um, watching TV before anybody get any well ideas, <laughs> but then I saw something, Mark 10, 27 mm -hmm. with man, it is impossible, but not with God for all things are possible with God. Correct. So yeah. on our own, we, it would kill us to give up just like the, the rich, um, guy here, it would kill us to give it up because it's like, there's a lot of money. We're hard for this, but it's not through our money. Is through God and we get that by being rooted in God. And the only other thing I would say on that, just so no one misinterprets, because a lot of people use this text to say, you know, um, you shouldn't aspire to be rich or mm -hmm. get money or God mm -hmm. don't like rich people, etc. Mm -hmm. But look at Job. Job was rich. Yeah. If we had to quantify Job, how much he had in money, it would probably be somewhere up there. But Job's heart posture is what was important. He had a relationship with God. He knew where his riches were coming from, the source of his riches. And he trusted that the Lord gives and the Lord takes. Correct. And the Lord did take from him. And Job, it was, I still trust in God. Even though you slay me, yeah, I will trust thee. And the Lord multiplied and what he multiplied. Had. So again, the cost of discipleship, and we see here the benefit as well. The same God that blessed you will take you through whatever you have to go through. If he tell you give up something, he will restore it in due time. Right. So on that note for Wednesday's section entitled, Can You Drink My Cup? Hmm. As Jesus approaches Jerusalem, he reveals to his disciples what will happen there. It is not a scenario they believe in or want to hear. Jesus specif specifies the outline of his death and resurrection, and it is quite striking. But when it is not what you want to hear, we all know we just dismiss something. Mm -hmm. hmm. This is apparently what James and John do as they come to Jesus with a private request. In response to Jesus' question about whether they can endure his suffering and death, James and John request to sit at his right and left hand when he comes into glory. While their request may seem a bit self-centered, considering their commitment to Jesus' ministries, their intentions were not purely selfish. I agree. I disagree with that. <laughs> I, 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 uh, I guess I get what the writer was trying to get at, but I, I can't say I agree with that. I, I honestly just think it's they selfish. Because they wanted to be um, like... They wanted position. Yeah, the, they wanted the, possession the glory of the prestige. Right. Yeah, well, Conte Chelsea. We can ask, yeah. maybe I'll get up there. <laughs> <laughs> they may have sought these positions out of a sincere desire for honor and closeness to Jesus right. rather than solely for personal gain. Correct. You know, you had this whole relationship. I mean, I thought Peter would have. Desire maybe for honor. But yeah, but closeness to Jesus. Yeah. Anyways. Jesus then tries to have James and John understand the full implications of their request for positions of honor in his kingdom. He asks them if they can endure the suffering symbolized in his cup in Gethsemane and on the cross, and if they can undergo his baptism, which represents his death and burial. The cup refers to the suffering Jesus will face, as in Mark 14, 36, while the baptism signifies his death and burial, similar to his baptism in Mark 1. However, James and John fail to grasp the death of Jesus' words and their future implications. What does the ignorance then of the disciples tell us about what it means to follow Jesus. What does Jesus' response in Mark 10, 42 to 45 tell us about leadership in our churches and about our acts of service? Mm. All right. So as was mentioned, it seems as though these guys thought that Jesus can be this big shot and then want to be the vice presidents, right? <laughs> um, but that's not how it went down. Ultimately, Jesus was killed. And then the, the let's also showcase that James and John also went through some terrible experiences mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, if they knew that this is how it would have gone on, I think that they would have probably uh, renounced the, the claim of wanting to be next to Jesus. Right. Um, but ultimately, it showcases that sometimes to follow Jesus, it means sacrifice. Sacrifice in ways that we can't imagine because John would have not expected that he would have been on an island mm -hmm. abandoned. Mm -hmm. Right. And John 
killed, beheaded. James, yeah. Mm, like, James, killed by yeah. a sword. Right, James, sorry. So it's like, at knowing that this is what serving Jesus brings, I don't think that they would have wanted to be as close to him. It's because they want to be close to the man. As close to him, knowing that this is what it, it, it leads to. Right? And ultimately, though, as a... Following Jesus means that you need to sacrifice and also have a life of service. Because yeah. it doesn't always mean that, like, it can rain gold on your property, mm -hmm. right? And you just got enough money and your car can never break down and you on wind free gas at all, right? For the rest of your life. It oftentimes, and we can see a lot of stories in the Bible where it showcases that it means you can die. It means that your family can die. It means that you can have some terrible experiences. Um, but ultimately, it's to showcase that as a Christian or as a follower of God, you are to serve. You're to serve others and to aid others. It isn't about clout. Correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I, well, for me, I was thinking about Romans 12, verse 2. It tells us not to conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And I think the disciples' misunderstanding <laughs> this situation started highlighting, highlighted that in choosing to follow Jesus, our thinking needs to be transformed. We need to move away from a sort of self-centered um, sort of motives to more uh, a Christ, a Christ-centered perspective. Hmm. Um, I was also thinking that, as you said about the leaders, especially, we need to be humble enough. And I think Stefan was mentioning earlier, uh, we need to be humble enough to serve, not just being of service to God, but being of service to our fellow man. So we should be seeking the positions of authority, as you said, for the clout, Mm -hmm. or for the prestige that it brings, especially when it comes to position in the church. Mm -hmm. You know, some people will be fighting for a first eldership position because... Like, if they just get paid, you don't get paid. You know, money and that. <laughs> no, yeah, sure but they, think, they probably money. think they gain extra blessings from God. My thing is, God God wants your heart ultimately. You, don't, you should right. be doing things out of a transactional relationship with God. Mm -hmm. You know, we should be doing things because we love God. Correct. So when, we, when he calls us to serve... We need to learn to be of service, not only to him, but also to persons around us. Correct. Yeah. Uh, Go ahead, Stefan. Um, along the lines of what Jerome was saying, I was um, basically saying that, again, the greatest leaders like need all need to also be servants, right? Mm -hmm. And I yeah. find that sometimes when we gain power, we just feel the need to impose our authority before actually finding out like the needs of, of, of the people. That we're yeah. responsible for. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You're actually responsible for that. So, like... I think that sometimes God may call our um or ask us to to actually listen to said people. But sometimes in our own understanding and selfishness, we try to still do what we think is necessary rather than what God thinks is necessary. Right? And Proverbs 18, chapter 2 actually says, like, fools find no pleasure in understanding, but delight in hearing their own opinions. So when you find persons that 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 just don't listen to people, just always telling themselves, like, this is what we ought to do. Uh, and and trying to get their point across all mm. the time where we'll cause them foolish, foolish right yeah. so i think that that yeah. the pardon no no oh, i think that that this this speaks about the leadership in our churches and how leaders ought to also be great servants yeah i was saying for me our ability to serve improves as our relationship with christ deepens mm. so like the same you mentioned a point that just made me think of that. When you said John and James didn't think, John didn't think he'd be stranded on Patmos and James didn't think he would be headed. Remember when Jesus came to these different, all the different disciples, some were fishermen, some were tasks, et cetera. I said, come follow me, make you fishers of men. Mm -hmm. You think if he said, come, you know, lonely lane, you can get beheaded a little later and what's not. Do you think they would have followed him at that time? No. Because sure. he didn't, they didn't know who he was. They didn't have that relationship. So for me, look at the progression they had from the time they were called up until the point some of them were beheaded, some um, thing was stranded up, almost, et cetera. So for me, the more we deepen our relationship with Christ and we try to be like him, the better servants we should be. So the mm. three things, the three key points I pulled from there is this whole thing challenged us to redefine leadership in terms of it is a humble service rather than authority or prominence. Yeah. So like you guys said, and I won't be first elder because I put it on my CV or people see me as, oh, I get a <laughs> special parking lot. Mm -hmm. um, it calls us to examine our motives and attitudes. Louis had alluded to that saying, so, you know, it's not both for clout or anything. Our actions must reflect Christ's late servanthood. Yeah. It emphasizes the importance of sacrificial love and selflessness in all our interactions, which is what Stefan was just saying um, about the fact that 
you ain't just putting your opinion out there and telling everybody this is what it is. So for me, those are the three key things coming out there. Yeah. Okay, good. And Thursday's section um, speaks, the title speaks to what our leaders ought to ask. What do you want me to do for you? Hmm. In Thursday's account, we see that as Jesus is leaving Jericho, a blind man sitting and begging beside the road hears of his passing. This blind man who the Bible recognizes as Bartimaeus began to shout for Jesus and ask him to have mercy on him. Many who were there, many were there, sorry, many who were there were pleading with this man to hold his peace. But this made him cry out even more. Jesus eventually stops and suffers the man to come unto him. In addition to rising, he threw away his garment and went to Jesus. Jesus again displaying his wit asks, what do you want me to do for you? The blind man asks for the thing his flesh craves most at that time, and that is his sight. Jesus then says something that is extremely pertinent. Go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. Immediately, Bartimaeus receives his sight and follows Jesus. Now, what does this teach us about the importance of our faith in Christ? And have you had a Bartimaeus moment where you had to cry out? Um, <laughs> as Stefan mentioned, I guess the thing that jumped out to me and the last time I related it, that the blind man throws off his cloak as he comes to Jesus. And the last time I said that in that day, blind people were at the bottom of society, yeah. right? Along with widows and orphans. And these people were below subsistence level and in real peril. And the cloak would have likely been the man's security as a lesson. So leaving that behind, meaning that they had had this sort of ultimate faith in Jesus. Correct. He threw away all his security, he threw away everything he had. <laughs> And he went to Jesus. I remember this thing we we say at church, right? especially as a race of faith, uh, forsaking all, I trust him, F-A-I-T-H. And the man forsake all that he had mm -hmm. and, and he ran to Jesus. And it says, I'm pulling from the end of the Thursday session, it says that this story is the close of the discipleship session in Mark, serving as a book end with any, with the other story of healing a blind man in Mark. Um, so the, the two stories illustrate how discipleship is about seeing the world with new eyes. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's not clearly at first, but following Jesus in the way that he leads. So I think that is, I think, I think it really shows us the sort of discipleship we need to need. One that where we, we jump out and just follow Jesus in, right. in faith. Um, what we will say here is this. It seems as though they were trying to not allow the guy to interact with Jesus, first of all, right? And when, when the, when the asking man's like, just keep quiet. My man shouts out louder because he have faith that in interacting with Jesus here and now, he will be ultimately healed, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, if only we would trust in Jesus like that, just like him, by the way, I think children showcase us our faith in Jesus, mm -hmm. right? My man was like, this is it. Then can heal, Jesus can heal me. I just need to make an effort. Children also showcase that, that kind of like blind faith in God as well. Mm -hmm. and ultimately, the guy showcased that it was it was right but because he was ultimately healed and i would say it's important to showcase this faith in jesus because i think that's what he wants from us the whole thing about the faith as a mustard seed my man's faith was like orange size you know ultimately <laughs> my man was able to gain regain or, or gain for the, the first seat. time mm -hmm. his vision right um have i had a moment like that possibly but i ain't come on here to talk my business um but I, I could definitely say by experience that showcasing ultimate faith in Jesus when it may not make sense, it, it may not seem as though um, this thing may happen, uh, leads to great things happening in your life as a result of that faith shown in Jesus. Mm -hmm. I think that even though we're this um, lesson this week is talking about things that the disciples should have been paying attention to as they want to become disciples, uh, we as Christians should ultimately want to become disciples of Jesus as well. Mm -hmm. And it's important for us to showcase this level of faith in situations that we go through on a day to day basis. Um, because, you know, life for mind, like things always work out great. You don't always got as much money as you want or the best living environment or whatever. Mm -hmm. But by showcasing faith in Jesus in times where things might suck, um, provides you with the opportunity to cry out as my guy here did and be healed. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that that is important, even though you might be fearful or whatever, is important for us to showcase that faith in God. Mm -hmm. 
And just to be clear, based on what Leslie said, um, you know, sometimes where we, where we might not have any money or, or as Leslie said, use the word suck. Um, I think that faith here is not telling us to just be stupid. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. We're not supposed to just go and spend all of our money and then say, oh, right, you know, God. the Lord, the Lord, the Lord will, mm -hmm. will, yeah. will provide. Like God expects you to be sensible also. Right. Yeah. So I don't think that faith here, just to be clear to our viewers, that faith here means stupidity. Right. It it just shows that we have a reliance, a certain reliance upon God when, mm -hmm. um, you know, when we call on him. But um, the importance of faith in Christ, I think that not only not only this story, but there are countless stories throughout the Bible where it, it literally alluded to the fact that this person's faith actually healed them or saved them. Right? Or saved someone connected to them. Exactly. Mm. Like like the the, the woman on the cross. Okay. Yeah. Right? Mm. The woman that touched Jesus' garment. Jairus' daughter. Exactly. Yeah. So we, we we see countless countless stories being told in the Bible where faith plays that important role. It, it is not the act. But it's the act of faith that saved these people or, or, or would have saved their circumstance, for lack of better words. Um, me personally, I don't think that I've had a Bartimaeus moment where I, I literally cried out, right? But um, <clears throat> there was a time when I was super sick. Um, and I just could tell you, I have some bad sinusitis. And my sinuses was actually like the drip was so bad that. Um, I had like inflammation in my lungs and, and stuff. It was a horrible experience. Like I thought that I was, I was, I had COVID again. Right. <laughs> but I actually went to the doctor the daytime, uh, cause I told myself I can't take anymore. I was drinking vitamin C like a madman <laughs> and I was going to the doctor. I was going by Alanis, but then on my way there, I told myself I feel too bad. So I had to go to the doctor. I stopped by the doctor. And when I left the doctor, then I went by Alanis and while I was by Alanis, then immediately, like I was eating food and my chest was so tight, like I could not breathe. So then she had to rough, rush me to FMH and it was a whole thing. And then I actually told her to the point where I thought that I was a goner. I, I literally thought I was going to die. Yeah. But it turns out that I was, I was having a panic attack from, from the constant, like, cause mm -hmm. I was coughing, my chest was hurting. So the constant. Thing was just it, mm. it lead it to a panic attack right um i think that not i think my cry out moment was a silent cry out moment mm. right where i i asked god to like just be with me in this time and uh, do not let me be a goner in this moment <laughs> right i don't think that i live my whole life just to 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 that, that from, from, from <laughs> <sunlight>. <laughs> you understand so i was asking god like just just help me in this moment yeah you understand and and that was my silent cry out moment um i think that throughout this episode my my silent cry out moment was was it also had her a little you know because she was kind of scared too just seeing me in that that vulnerable state mm -hmm. right yeah. and i think that my faith in that moment actually aided me also because we shortly after she could tell you shortly after that i was so good i was sitting down normal and everything mm -hmm. but i think that that is what god is trying to, to show us sometimes we we like for me when i got sick sometimes we are actually in the process of just popping pills hitting vitamin c packets all of this nonsense when it's just take a simple prayer right and, mm -hmm. and and we think also that prayer means to go down on our knees and fast for, for a day or yeah, two and yeah. do all this whole shebang but sometimes god just literally wants us to reach out to him to show a little reliance on him and then he will bring it to bring us through our our situations that we have there and the same way you said before about not being stupid in turn and not being stupid to spending money that's not to say don't take your medication and right, just pray right, correct. at the same time. Correct. We're, not, we're not advising that. Correct. You know, yeah. seek medical help when you need to seek medical help, correct. but also trust in God as well. Correct. All right. So to bring it now all to a close, Jesus consistently showed love and acceptance towards children. He appreciated their sincere affection and genuine love. Their grateful praise and pure expressions brought him joy and comfort, especially in a contrast to dealing with deceitful and hypocritical adults. Everywhere Jesus went, his compassionate face and gentle demeanor endeared him to children, which readily trusted and loved him.
Tonight's lesson emphasizes that for those in positions of power and wealth, like the young ruler, the idea of giving up everything to follow Christ may seem like too great a sacrifice. However, according to Jesus' teachings, complete obedience and self-surrender are essential for discipleship. The language used to convey this message can be direct and authoritative because it underscores the necessity of removing anything that could corrupt or undermine a person's spiritual well-being. There is no other path to salvation than to wholeheartedly follow Christ's teachings, even if it requires sacrificing worldly comforts and attachments. With this in mind, John, can you close us with prayer? Sure. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for another opportunity that we had to discuss your word. We thank you that it can be a light unto our feet, a lamp unto our path. We pray that as we go forward, that we will learn to have a deeper faith in you so that we can be greater, a greater witness of the things that you can do in our lives as well as the lives of others who may be seeking to follow you. Mm -hmm. We pray that as we interact with those who are new to the faith, even children that are representation of what Christianity is, maybe one that brings them into a glorious relationship with you, one that they can enjoy and one that we can enjoy so that the church can go forward in its mission. We pray for the podcast, we pray that it continues to grow from strength to strength and that we all, we continue to do the work that you have inspired us to do. Mm -hmm. Bless us this Sabbath and help us enjoy the remainder of ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So we just want to thank the Study 17 tonight for coming in to share uh, our thoughts. Um, Louis and Jerron, it was kind of last minute, but they came through. Um, God used them in the way that we expected him to use them. So we just want to say a <laughs> special thank you to them. Yeah, um, as usual, we look forward to your comments. Join us next week for our lesson nine entitled Jerusalem Controversies. Have a happy Sabbath and God bless.